Good evening and welcome to Left, Right and Center. I'm Vishnu Shobh. On the program tonight, Prime Minister Narendra Modi started day two of his visit to the United States by leading the yoga event at the United Nations building in New York on International Yoga Day. He's now on his way to Washington where the state visit will officially begin. The Yoga Day celebrations are an excellent example of India's soft diplomacy prowess. On this show though, we will be looking not just at the United Nations events, but also at the business end of the state visit to the US, what it's all about. We have a fantastic panel of guests, including senior US ambassadors who've led and really worked the relationship in just the last few years. Ambassador Kenneth Juster joins me in a few moments. Later on on the show, the former Deputy National Security Advisor Pankaj Saran, India's IT Minister Rajiv Chandrasekhar, Bharat Barai, a champion of the BJP in the United States, uh, among others. But first, the big event today was India's soft diplomacy. And in fact, it was a message to the entire world, not just about diplomacy, but about health. And a mission which the Prime Minister has made his own, a mission which is seen and accepted around the world, certainly by the United Nations. In fact, there was a Guinness Book of World Records uh, record which was actually made today. The maximum number of nationalities, people from 135 countries participating at this Yoga Day event with the Prime Minister leading on. Yoga is free from copyright, free from patents and free from royalty payments. Yoga is adaptable to your age, gender, and fitness level. Yoga is unifying. It is for everyone, for all ethnicities, for all faiths, and for all cultures. Yoga is a way of life. A holistic approach to health and well-being, a way to mindfulness in thoughts and action. All right. Well, joining us at this stage, Ambassador Kenneth Juster, former American ambassador to India. Thanks very much, uh, Ambassador Juster, for being with us. You've worked this relationship so very closely in the past. Before we get to um, perhaps the business end of the visit, what we can expect in Washington, D.C., your thoughts on International Yoga Day, the way that India has really promoted this, Narendra Modi has promoted this, it's become an international cause. Uh, who would have thought that India's diplomacy in the United States on day one would be about yoga and not about some sort of defense deal or something along those lines? Well, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, the International Yoga Day is just one of many examples of India's importance in the world and how the Indian culture has spread throughout the world. And it's what's known as soft power. And it's quite inspiring to see the prime minister doing yoga and having so many people of so many nationalities joining him there at the United Nations. I did yoga when I was in India and have discussed it with the prime minister. So I'm very much in support of what he's doing. If we look at uh, the state visit um, and um, where we are now with the relationship with the United States, we are now talking about ICET. Um, that's a new series of agreements, uh, high technology transfers, which may happen in the future. But you have worked through the foundational agreements, uh, which actually led us to where we are right now. Could you tell us about that journey and how difficult it was at stages? Well, there's actually been a long journey over the last 23 years that have transformed the U.S.-India relationship. Way back in 2001, I co-founded with Conwell Sybil, who was the Foreign Secretary. I was Under Secretary of Commerce at the time, a high technology cooperation group, which first began our efforts to provide high-level high technology to India. Uh, and we then worked through an initiative known as the Next Steps in Strategic Partnership. We had the Civil Nuclear Deal. We named India as a major defense partner. We did uh, some further modifications with something called STA-1 to give India greater licensing. In the defense area, we concluded after many years of negotiation, foundational agreements on sharing logistics, on secure communications, on providing geospatial information and industrial cooperation. And now we've launched this initiative for critical and emerging technologies, which will help us coordinate 
on semiconductors and artificial intelligence, quantum computing and the like. So we keep taking the relationship to the next level and the next level will come at this uh, summit meeting and the state visit focused heavily on the defense pillar and on uh, critical and emerging technologies that uh, we'll be doing together. So those are two very important aspects of what's been a very broad and deep relationship. If you just look at the military relationship uh, itself, um, what is the future of, for example, the Malabar naval exercises? I ask because there's always been this very high level of military exercises which we've been, uh, which we've been hosting. Uh, our systems talk to each other, courtesy some of the foundational agreements which we signed. Uh, our forces are integrated at the level of operations whenever they do train. What's the future of this military relationship? Well, you pointed out the Malabar military exercise. Let me just step back and say that we have developed increasingly sophisticated exercises over the last several years that not just are service to service, but we had a tri-services exercise that was launched while I was ambassador called Tiger Triumph, and that continues on. And we reinstituted the Malabar exercise across four countries, mm -hmm. United States, India, Japan, and Australia. And all of these exercises are becoming increasingly sophisticated and are very important for trying to maintain uh, freedom of navigation in the Indian and Pacific Oceans uh, and freedom of trade and making sure that there's a good maritime domain awareness. And again, this is all just elevating the level to which the countries are coordinating. But it's important to also note that they, this is not a military alliance. Uh, uh, Japan, uh, India and the United States are strategic partners. And so there are limitations to what we will do together, but we've also got a lot of common interests that we're pursuing in the defense uh, sphere. Jet engine technology is one of the areas where the U.S. is really pushing uh, what it's, uh, it's done. It's not done this sort of transfer of technology with any other country, perhaps. Uh, how significant is that as America looks to sort of further that military relationship uh, with, with India, perhaps in, in terms of selling India new weaponry, getting into uh, collaborations with India? This jet engine technology deal, uh, tech transfer deal, how important is that? This is huge. This is, again, a major step that will take the relationship to the next level, as they say. Uh, the United States has never transferred the type of technologies that are being reported in the press, in which I've read that 11 manufacturing technologies related to these sophisticated GE jet engines will be transferred to India, and then there'll be co-production of the jet engines in India. And these are critical for uh, many fighter aircraft and this will help over time India to indigenize its military uh, uh, manufacturing and to make its own military equipment and also friendly in the United States to work on making equipment that can be exported uh, to third parties overseas. So this is a very significant step. And as I said, it's something that the United States has not shared with others. So uh, important both from a military perspective and from a relationship perspective. Ambassador Jasser, I'm not sure there's any one answer to this, but is the U.S.-India relationship premised on shared concerns on China, or is it more about the people-to-people -people equations that we have and the fact that the diaspora is doing brilliantly in the United States? Well, it's a multi-dimensional relationship. It covers virtually every issue of human endeavor, and the foundation is the tremendous people-to-people -people relationships. There are over 4 million Indian Americans in the United States and close to a million Americans in India, often children of uh, Indians while they were studying or working in the United States. So that's very important, but we also do share a variety of interests and we do have some strategic uh, clarity that we share regarding the uh, potential concerns raised by the rise of China. Uh, but our interests will not always be the same on China. India is in a different place geographically and historically but we do have a convergence of interest, and this gives further impetus to the strategic partnership. But the strategic partnership began to be transformed in the early 2000s when both countries were on work, work, workable relations with China, and we did not have the type of concerns that we have today. So the relationship stands on its own, but clearly the converging concerns about China have given further impetus uh, to all of the things we do together, but especially in the 
sectors of defense and technology. Yeah. Ambassador Justo, wonderful speaking to you. Thank you very much. I'm sure you'll be watching the next couple of days very, very closely indeed. Uh, we're joined at the stage. Thank you, sir. By Elbridge Colby. He served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Development. And he had the opportunity of, of meeting Prime Minister uh, Modi today. Uh, Mr. Colby, what happened in that meeting? Could you tell us a little bit about it? Great to be with you. And apologies, I'm here uh, actually in transit back from New York to Not Washington. Not a problem. We, so we insisted it. on speaking to you. Had you stopped your car and sort of locked you I up have there, but go the right car, ahead. So thank you. It, it, it was an extraordinary, let me just say, it was an extraordinary personal honor to be able to meet with Prime Minister Modi and, and some of his top staff. I think the discussion covered a wide range of issues, uh, the geopolitical matters I in particular emphasized. I think the, the, the shared uh, concerns about China's increasing aggressiveness and uh, sort of power, but others brought up the economic relationship, the people to people relationship. So it was, it, was, uh, it was really illuminating, but also inspiring to hear from the prime minister of the world's largest country directly. What did uh, the, the prime minister actually say about the potential of the relationship from a geostrategic standpoint between America and India? I had the impression of somebody who was very confident in the trajectory of the relationship, he and his team. I think that's shared here. I think what Ambassador Jester, Ken Jester just said is widely shared here. So I, it, seemed, it seemed to me very sound, but seemed to have a sense that the trajectory is moving in the right direction and in many ways is accelerating. So that was very encouraging to see as well. Did the Prime Minister listen very carefully to, to your views? And uh, can I just ask, what is it that you, that you brought up? Well, I uh, brought up, I think, something that, that friends in the Indian government have heard from me before, which is, and I published, for instance, in the Hindustan Times earlier this year, uh, that the, the, not only the challenge from China in kind of a geopolitical or sort of vague sense, but China's increasing military activity and the possibility for conflict in this decade, which you do hear regularly from Americans. Uh, you know, I had the impression that the prime minister and his team were very aware uh, and, and concerned, but not daunted by the challenge. So I think what's happening with the jet engines and other forms of military cooperation are really important because I agree with Ambassador Jester, although I do think so much of the relationship is about our shared interests and our shared concern about China, which is, you know, for the first time in 150 years, China is an econ economy of equivalent size to the United States. This is a new dynamic. So I think both of us are, are being impelled, uh, as, as Ken rightly said, to, you know, break barriers. And that's very important. And, th and that was certainly the impression of sort of confident but the trajectory is in a right place that the prime minister uh, gave off. You know, just while we have you here, and it's great that, that we do, uh, the fact, Mr. Colby, that India has a very close relationship with Russia, uh, and that's not going to go away. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons uh, for that. And is that something that America has accepted? Well, my own view, I actually think the way that the foreign minister Jai Shankar puts it is right. Look, I think we are actually bound together by shared interests. India is a confident country, a growing country, a, a, a grow, rising superpower, you know, if not today, soon. Um, and our interests will not always align, as I think Ken, Ken rightly put it. And we have a difference of view on Russia. I think, you know, we have said here in the United States that China is our top priority. I believe the Indian government has specified China as its top threat. So this should be the main thing that we focus on, and we need each other. I don't know who needs each other more, but it's an arid and sort of pointless debate because we both really need each other. And so I think, in credit, the American official system has been able to put you know, India's position in perspective. There are elements in the political debate here which are less sensitive, but I think what we're seeing here with the prime minister's visit and the way he's being feted is that our system is, is you know, making the right priority, which is working closely together with, with India. Elbridge Colby, wonderful speaking to you. Thank you very much for joining us on NDTV. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very Pleasure. much indeed. Anita Bhatia, Deputy Executive Director and Assistant Secretary General of Resource Management at the UN System Coordination, looking at sustainability and partnerships, uh, is with us at this stage. Thanks very much for being with us. Your thoughts first up on India and, its, and our soft diplomacy. The fact that this entire visit, it's a state visit, began with something like yoga. Uh, and it's something that's been so widely accepted. Any, any in initial thoughts on that? Thanks, Vishnu. Uh, great to be with you. And just to clarify, I just retired from the UN, as you know, but I was still very much an observer. So let me just share some thoughts on International Day of Yoga. First and foremost, as Ambassador Justice said, I think it's a fabulous display of India's soft power. And it's really good for India to reappropriate this because, you know, when yoga first came to the US, uh, it was being practiced by everybody except Indians. So what I've been really happy about and have observed very closely 
in the last few years is how this is now part of not just uh, a personal brand, but India's corporate brand in the world. So whether it's at COP27 or at any of the G20 events, it is fantastic to see that India is showing the rest of the world something which has been part of our cultural heritage for millennia. Dr. Bharat Barai, member of uh, the Overseas Friends of the BJP with us as well. Dr. Barai, you've been perhaps the biggest champion of, uh, of India and uh, our interest in the Prime Minister Modi and his interest in the United States. Can you give us a sense of, uh, of how Indians in the United States are reacting to this visit? You know, the Indians in the United States have been fan of Prime Minister Modi going back to 2014. And every year, his popularity has continued to grow. And I would say he's 10 times more popular than he was in 2014. So we have had a mad rush of people. In fact, for last 10 days, all I'm doing is handling my phone. All the phone call text messages, they keep on coming and going and everybody wants to join. And this is the problem. So it's a big problem, but it's a problem of happiness that people want to attend. We could have hundreds and hundreds of people who keep on texting and calling. So there is no question that he is very popular. But I want to say that he is popular not because as a Narendra Modi, but as a Narendra Modi who is a visionary, what he did in the state of Gujarat since 2014, what he has done for India, how he is trying to sell India to American businesses, to American uh, corporate leaders, to American congressmen, American senators, American administration. That is what he is doing successfully. He is the number one salesperson for India. He wants to bring prosperity to India. He wants to bring manufacturing jobs to India. He wants to bring topmost agriculture to India. He wants India to be having the best, most sophisticated weapons. So the two bad neighbors that we have, Pakistan and China, can be effectively countered. So everybody, most of the NRIs are very well educated. They are very well financially, and yet they respect this man because we love India. Most of the NRIs are very much attached to India, and they want to see that Prime Minister Modi is successful in bringing more prosperity to India, better luck for India, better manufacturing jobs, better military, better agriculture. Ms. Bhatia, the fact that despite uh, all of these aspects that uh, Dr. Barai was, was talking about, there are certain impediments uh, in the relationship as far as some in India uh, are, are, are concerned. For example, the United States every now and again does raise the issue of declining media standards, of human rights, of Kashmir, etc., etc. <clears throat> but the fact that we are actually seeing this relationship uh, so closely where America is looking at so much more, is it an indicator that as far as the U.S. is concerned, they are willing to look away from these issues to primarily focus on the larger issue of the relationship. Vishnu, you have to realize the United States is also a democracy. Look at in India. In spite of showing so many good things for India, working tirelessly for India, making it the fifth largest economy, making it one of the best militaries in the world, and constantly trying to improve, in spite of them, I would say there are more people who are criticizing Narendra Modi in India, mostly for political reasons, than we have a small number of people in USA who are not happy or who have negative things to say. But if you read the letter, I read the letter, they are saying 80% good things. And part of the problem is that there is a lobby in the United States that is constantly out to criticize India all in name of human rights. They talk about eight or nine Muslims who might have been lynched, but they don't talk about hundreds of Hindus who have been murdered in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So yes, India is not a perfect democracy. India is not a perfect secular country, but it's much better country than many people. Think of it, United States, how many people are killed by gun violence? In my own town of Chicago, every weekend more people are killed by gun violence then they have been killed in India in the last nine years. Yep. So there is always a small fringe minority on both the sides of extremists, extreme right wing and extreme left wing, who are never happy unless it is 100% that way. 
and that doesn't happen in a democracy. Arita Bhatia, if we, uh, if we look at the other aspect of the relationship, which is a huge positive, it is the diaspora. Do you believe it is the diaspora in the United States which is the bedrock of the growing equation? I don't think it is just one thing. I think this is a multi-dimensional relationship. It is focused both on that people-to-people -people connect. In India is very, uh, in the U.S. is very influential and does occupy positions that allow it to shape policy dialogue and to have an input into key decisions. So I think that it's not just about the people to people relationship. It is also about an alignment of strategic interests that are driven not just by China, but also the fact that uh, America would like to cooperate much more with India on issues having to do with defense, on issues having to do with energy transition, on issues having to do with digital infrastructure. So I don't think you can say that this is just a people to people relationship. It has very many different aspects. I also want to address the point that was raised earlier yes, about uh, whether the US will actually raise human rights concerns. And I actually uh, think that this will continue because, again, I don't think the relationship is unidimensional. There are real issues about lack of media freedom in India. There are real issues about civil society not being allowed to speak as it should. And these are very fundamental and real concerns. These concerns will continue to be raised not just by the U.S., but also in places and where appropriate by the United Nations and also by other organizations who are rightly concerned about the rollback of press freedoms and restrictions on civil society in India. So while India is doing remarkable things in terms of delivering development benefits to its citizens, of pushing on the basis of its digital welfare state, on massive new innovative investments and in things like UPI, uh, it is also true that there is a need to pay attention to the foundational pillars of democracy, which include press freedom and respect for all human rights. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Barai, um, you'll be meeting Prime Minister Modi as well. What will your message to him be? Vishnu, if you might have permission, I have a little di different view than my friend Anita Bhatia. You know, in every country, in fact, the very fact that she is able to speak all those things, the very fact that people are complaining about it, speaks that there is full freedom. If there was no freedom, how would they be able to bring all those issues? Let's talk about Himachal Pradesh, it is Congress government. In Punjab, it's AAP government. In Bihar, it is the joint government. In West Bengal, there is Mamta Banerjee. Odisha, there is another government. Andhra Pradesh, YSR government. Tamil Nadu, DMK government. Karnataka Congress government. If it was not freedom, if everything was being manipulated, how come no, these people got saying that elected? There is freedom. There is freedom. So what? what people are saying is that there must be attention to certain foundational pillars of democracy, which include respect for freedom of the media. Nobody is saying this has nothing to do with whether there is a Congress uh, party-led administration or a BJP-led administration in a particular state. The gentleman there is Vishnu more freedom, asked whether There is more freedom in India you for the press than here. Issue in fact, Trump used to call that CNN is a... All right, okay, let's network. not, let's not outshout each other. Let's not, let's not get into one of those, those debates at all. I don't think any of you would like that. But Dr. Bharat Barai, briefly, because I'm running out of time on this segment, you know, when you do meet the Prime Minister, what is your message to him going to be? I want the Prime Minister, A, to make India strong militarily, economically, agriculturally, as well as energy resources, and tell us as diaspora what we can do to participate in India's growth story. We have been acting on our own, how to educate our congressmen and senator about India, and many of the misconceptions that they have about India, it is our job as diaspora to try to educate them, and we will continue to do that Nobody has to do it. We'll do it as son of India. Arita Bhatia, what would your key takeaways from this visit be? Well, first of all, it is an exceptional visit. And I think we have to recognize that it is making history. It is an extraordinary uh, achievement for India to have our prime minister be uh, able to address houses of Congress. Uh, this is not an honor that has been accorded 
for the second time to many world leaders. He joins a very small and select group of world leaders like Zelensky and Winston Churchill who have addressed Congress twice. Uh, the US has completely rolled out the red carpet for the prime minister. And I think my big takeaway is that this is uh, a way for us to, for Indians to feel very proud because India has really, really arrived on the global stage. I think the prime minister's visit just shows the degree to which India is now an absolutely indispensable partner on the global stage. Uh, I think what uh, EM, our foreign minister, has been doing uh, in towing a line in foreign policy where India's strategic interests mm -hmm. lead the way uh, is also remarkable. And I think the fact that we are on the global stage in this way is something that each and every one of us as an Indian can feel very proud of. Right. This is uh, the result of years of diplomacy, of years of growth, of years of an Indian diaspora that is among the most educated and influential in the world. So when you put all of this together, I have to tell you that as an Indian, yep. I feel exceptionally proud of seeing India uh, on the global stage in this way. And uh, I think this is something that should continue and will continue because we are taking our rightful place uh, in the globe now. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you both very much uh, for being with us. I'm joined at this stage by uh, Mr. Pankaj Saran. He's the former Deputy National Security Advisor of India. He's uh, helped really work uh, the aspects of the relationship with the United States, but certainly from a security standpoint, he's, uh, he's looked very closely at the challenges which we face when it comes to China or Pakistan or our maritime security. Thanks very much for being with us, Mr. Saran. To what extent of this visit uh, or the equation between India and the United States is based on that shared concern on China presently? Well, I think China is certainly a factor in the relationship because uh, what we have seen is that with the rise of China, uh, the United States and other countries in the world, they have also increased their partnerships with the Indo-Pacific region. And India also is engaged in much more external balancing so China is certainly a factor and what happened in 2020 has actually aggravated China's own security situation because it has forced India to look at other partners and to reinforce its own national security and national power. So if India is looking more towards the United States or other countries in the world, this has a lot to do with China's own behavior. Having said that, I don't think this is a relationship that can rest only on the China threat or the China challenge. Its contours are much wider. And in terms of national security, there is much that India and the United States can do uh, bilaterally to enhance each other's strengths and to leverage each other's respective complementarities and advantages. And I think this visit is, a, is, a, is, is probably going to set the stage for this kind of an evolution of the relationship in a direction in which it actually strengthens both the United States as well as India. And is an aspect of that, uh, presumably, the, the jet engine tech transfer to India? We'll have to wait and see if it's as profound as we want. Uh, but even in terms of what uh, we are likely to get uh, General Electric setting up shop with Hindustan Aeronautics in India. Uh, jet engine technology being made in India, it'll power several platforms. Do you believe that that's actually an aspect of what you're talking about as a bedrock that takes the relationship forward to the next level? Yeah, I think it's a great symbol. It's a great symbol of uh, newfound trust and a willingness to share sensitive technology. And uh, the, the real test of it is going to be whether uh, we can also then share the real technology and manufacture in India rather than just uh, be a purchaser. But it's, it's symbolic because it shows that there is a willingness on the part of the United States to modify its rules and regulations to share with India. And uh, definitely, uh, if you look at this, if impending and possible deal in the broader context of the push 
that has been given to the whole sector of critical and emerging technologies at the level of the two leaders, then I think it's a good start. But we have a long way to go because technology is clearly going to be the determinant of future power for any society in any country. You know, Mr. S uh uh, Mr. Saran, when you're talking about technology in the past, say even 15 years back, there was this deep apprehension about uh, getting into deep technology collaboration with uh, with the United States. But then we've signed agreements. We've signed uh, BECA, for example. We find, signed some of the other foundational agreements. SISMO is the other one that is significant. You know, where we have identical systems and we can actually operate militarily with uh, the Americans uh, through encrypted technology, secure communications fairly seamlessly. Uh, do you believe that this is ultimately where this relationship might be going, particularly in the naval sphere? Look, I don't think this is, uh, we are heading to any military alliance with the United States. We are not going to be part of the NATO, nor are we going to be part of the Five Eyes. But short of that, when it comes to, say, interoperability, uh, logistic support, uh, exercises, uh, training, uh, sharing of each other's threat perceptions, there will definitely be more convergence uh, I see in the years ahead. And, you know, the foundation of this kind of convergence is always in the kind of military platforms and systems uh, that uh, countries use. So, uh, certainly I would see that uh, we are proceeding in that direction, but again, uh, I think we should be very clear uh, that I don't think there is any intention uh, within the government of India to enter into any kind of a military alliance in the sense that we have understood it. I think we are entering a new era where we will enhance our military cooperation, our technology cooperation, our doctrinal cooperation, yet we will maintain our own strategic choices and spaces and continue to broaden our uh, strategic space in the geographical region that we live. And that includes China and the Indo-Pacific. Mr. Saran, a final question, and it happened in, uh, in the United Nations uh, overnight. Very, very strong statements by India with regard to the global architecture as it exists in fighting or naming, internationally, or naming terrorists as being internationally designated terrorists. The exact statement made by our representative was that we have righteous reasons to believe that something is genuinely wrong with the global counter-terrorism architecture. He was speaking about Sajid Meir. He was speaking about how you know, that, that he, he's not been... Uh, internationally designated because of the role of China. Do you believe that the United States can do more to help us in sort of pushing aside China and their concerns when it comes to global terrorism and naming terrorists? Yeah, look, at a general point, I think the India and the United States and other countries which share similar values need to work much more closely together in the United Nations system as a whole. On the specific issue of terrorism, absolutely. I mean, this is a non-negotiable threat which affects India's core interests. And I think here, China is doing more harm to itself because if it continues to obstruct uh, issues that are of, as the Chinese in their own words would say, the core of India's core interests, then they are driving India closer and closer to find other solutions, either within the United Nations by searching for new partners or more dangerously, outside the framework of the United Nations. And they are simply proving India's point right. that the current architecture is incapable of addressing the concerns of member states and particularly of India. So therefore, India's call to reform and restructure and its proposition that the post-1945 world order is basically lived its time, it's past its life, just gets more and more reinforced. Sure. All right, Mr. Saran, wonderful speaking to you. Forward uh, Deputy thank National you. Security Advisor of India, Pankaj Saran. Thank you very much, sir, for being with us. Thank you.